covering all your favorite parts of the 50-yard fight. This is the Inside the Walls podcast with Zach Heilman and Jim Bernier. Welcome again, fans of the 50-yard fight. This is the Inside the Walls podcast. Zach Heilman in here, as always, hosting alongside, of course, my good buddy, pal, uh, partner in crime, as we like to put it. Whatever other title you want to give him that that adds on that he is at my co-host, it is Jim Mernier on the opposite side. Uh, as we welcome you into our latest edition as well of our team preview series. Again, the days keep on ticking down until the NAL season is about to get underway. And as you can clearly see on the screen, it is episode 87 for us, and we are going to be previewing the folks over at the Vice Star Memorial Coliseum that are the Jacksonville Sharks entering the Shark Tank this week. This is very much, of course, Jim's territory. Jim, how you doing? It is, uh, sh- as they would sometimes say, uh, Shark Week for us this week. Not not Discovery Channel. It's, it's, it's Shark Week for us. It's our Shark Week. Well, it's Shark Week, and it's actually an episode where I can just talk about the Jacksonville Sharks and not get accused for talking about the Jacksonville Sharks. Yeah. So yeah, today right. the, the is the Jacksonville Sharks. Um, yeah, uh, we're down to four weeks until kickoff. Uh, tr- train camp is in ten days for every every team besides Albany, and yeah, just uh, everyone else plays besides Albany are in training camp. Uh, yeah, season's fast approaching. Before you know it, it'll be midway through the season, and hopefully at championship in a couple of weeks after that. So yeah, it's gonna be fast. Um, but yeah, this is a unique show it's a jacksonville sharks show um of course the jack sharks the <laughs> shark tank uh this is where egos go to rise um and yes there are some few additions on the graphic if you see if you're online on youtube um this may you know this has been a special request so yeah um but yeah it's pretty cool uh it's upcoming season it's a season i think that is unique in jacksonville with a new head coach that has history in the game um, with an organization that we've seen over the years and what we've talked about, they don't like losing. So again, last year was a, a resurgence after that horrible start. Now consistency and now the Gibson way here in uh, Jacksonville. And one thing we know about coach Gibson, he makes the playoffs in every sport he uh, season he coaches in. So am I saying predicting that the sharks are clinch a playoff spot? Yeah, uh, because I'm just following history. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, look, last year, if you're a Sharks fan, you know, I'd say the troops they rallied the troops pretty well after a pretty, I would say, kind of an ugly one and four start. Uh, respectable 500 record going into the playoffs. Just uh, and we're within one or two decent plays of and a uh, deuce from possibly getting an upset up in Albany, New York. So. You know, you have to feel happy last year, at least where you got to. Uh, this season, of course, new changes as we're talking, as we, as you maybe have figured out by now. Uh, Jason Gibson, he is now the head coach of the Jacksonville Sharks, bringing in his own, bringing in his own culture from the Columbus Lions, coming on over. Um, and we got, and I said the roster's kind of changed over. There's uh, some new faces that he's brought by, some that have stayed the same, but a lot of changes this season, I think. Uh, Jacksonville has definitely made to, uh, I would say, retool for this mm-hmm. year. Well, there's new changes. There's new players, and a lot of people that are in the Sharks organization are looking at us like, when is when's Jacksonville going to sign the big guy? Where's the big name? Because Jacksonville's notorious of signing big name guys. Um, there's really no big name sign, but a more of a plethora of good pl- players upper tier players that the Jacksonville can bring in. And uh, there's a couple of them that are coming back. Like Damian Jacobs is returning. Marvin Ross is returning. Michael Michael White is returning. Uh, Daniel Justino, who played in Orlando last year, is coming over. David Gilbert's returning. Anthony Johnson's returning. And the big one uh, who comes from the Columbus Lions is Darian Townsend. It's going to be a lethal weapon. Of course, there are other players on the team that uh, are not on the screen uh, again. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, there are other players that did are, are back with the Jacksonville Sharks. Uh, David Gilbert's back with the Jacksonville Sharks. Also, uh, Solomon's back with the Jacksonville Sharks. There are a few guys on this team um, that played last year. They're back, and they're and if you look at the roster and, and how Gibson's created this roster, it's. Basically, he is trying to control the line of scrimmage. 
and his defense. And like we've had Mason Espendoza on before, he, he says Gibson loves the middle of the field, a nose guard, a linebacker, and a backside safety or that third DB that should be the anchor of their defense. And if that continues to this season with the players that it's on there right now, with Anthony Johnson, with Renfro, with Damian Jacobs and Marvin Ross and Darian Townsend back there, uh, Jacksonville is going to have a good defense. And one thing we know from Gibson teams in the past with, with the care uh, with the Cobra, um, not Cobras, the Columbus Lions is he always, his teams are always in the top two league and top two in the standings in defensive statistics. And if Jacksonville has that type of same narrative of the defense, Jacksonville does have some skilled players too. Um, that he may have not had in Columbus that he has in Jacksonville. And there, it's, you could say a filling out process early, but with the names and the players that they got on the roster right now, Jacksonville has a solid team. Um, I'm not going to be, a, I know I'm a fan. Everyone knows I'm a fan, um, but I'm not going to say everyone winning the dang championship. No, I'm not like that. There are good players. We had Justin on, on have, we have Justin's interview coming up here pretty shortly about it. Um, it's just a different mentality that's in Jacksonville now. And it's unique to a, to a fan like, well, we used to win championships all the time. Now you can tell that there's a different kind of culture being built in Jacksonville, just not one player at times, the whole roster, the whole organization is being built differently. So um, even with the key additions and the new guys, so for your Shark fans out there are waiting for the big guy to drop uh, for the Sharks, <laughs> uh, that's not going to happen. Um, it's not because Jacksonville can't, you know, spend the money. Well, Jacksonville can. They just don't. They want to build a culture, um, a culture mentality here in the city. Uh, it's like if you come to Shark Tank, you're going, you're going to play against a very disciplined team, and a team that's going to fight you all four quarters. And it's not going to be led by a lot of egos, uh, like it has in the past. So it's a new era in Jacksonville, and that's a Gibson way. So if people in Jacksonville don't know what the Gibson way is. Um, as a Sharks fan, we may know as a guy, he throws a red flag too many times. Uh, now he's on our side, so uh, he'll be doing that to opponents. But uh, that's the Gibson way. It's uh, good character, solid teams, great defense, and playing for the moon with sound football. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, that, and I think that's something you expect from Jason Gibson. We've said it a ton this season, or at least this off season, and mm -hmm. kind of leading in. Um, you saw what he did in his long tenure over in, Colum in Columbus, Georgia. Um, dude, dude is a type of coach. He brings the most out of the players around him. That is how he has done his style for years. And that's essentially what he's bringing to Jacksonville. And, you know, he brought over, like, like you talked, some pretty key stars to this roster that are guys he knows. And I think he brought over, he's been getting solid veteran talent around him as well. And, and credit, I mean, still some can come in. Right now, but I think like you see guys like, for example, you know, we're talking like a Darian Townsend who just dominated last season as a receiver. Excellent grab for them in terms of specialty player. Marvin Ross coming over. You can't say enough about him and his time in the NAL. Another one that you have to give tons of praise for for getting as a pickup. And then you get like some guys that to me have been, you know, some ballers that maybe they haven't gotten as much recognition, but they're good veterans this league. You know, like a Jimmy Goodlow, who's had plenty of recognition on his on both sides of the ball from last year as well. Um, Shakai Holmes, who, I mean, you know, he was with the Sharks last season. So again, another solid pickup you got to be happy for. And these are guys going to be Maulers, Mauler mm -hmm. type of players that are going to give their 110%. Not saying no one else can't will, but like Gibson expects... You know, much like Manas, they they expect the full, full one hundred and ten percent effort. You know, nonstop on every play. That's mm -hmm. that's the that's the Gibson way out there, and he's going to get that. Another pickup I like. You know, I talk about Ross, but they also got Jabari Gorman, who made a name for himself last year in Albany, who they're going to be having on that roster too. I expect him to continue his upward trend he had towards the end of the season when he came on and kind of to me elevated that secondary for the empire. So mm -hmm. watch out for him. I think that's another good pickup that they got away. And then uh, as we talk in this league, you can't knock having a good kicking option because deuces are just so important. You know, Daniel Justino being able to bring him on, you know, and have him on as your kicker this year, you know, credit the footballs, of course, were part of the problem last season, but to have again, someone that is that steadfast kicking option, Great mm -hmm. choice as well. They're going to be set at that position too for starting in week one. 
And there's other guys. You can look at the roster itself, and you can go down to the rookie side of things. And Gibson's told me this, and I've talked to other people around the organization. Uh, two names you need to keep an eye on, especially for the Jacksonville, uh, Jacksonville Sharks, is Reggie Todd, the wide receiver out of Troy. Mm-hmm. And also his uh, what could play at the same time, uh, Kali McLean as well from Troy. Two guys who are uh, tall, fast. Uh, Reggie Todd, 6'5". Uh, that's a tall for that's a tall do for a receiver in the NL. But also the question that we get from fans is who is going to be the guy behind center? And that's going right. to be Graham Kelly. And Graham Kelly has experience in the Canadian game. And from the highlights I've seen and from people I've messaged about Graham Kelly, um, our, our our third co-host, which would be joining us during the season, might uh, not like this comparison, but he reminds me a lot of Mason Espinoza. Same type <laughs> of built. Um, his arm motion, same. So if Graham Kelly is the reincarnation of Mason Espinoza, I think Jackson will be in good hands. But again, uh, one thing that we know for Gibson, he wants to find a young quarterback to build the team around for years, uh, for a couple of years. So if if the idea and goal for this team is to win championships for just not this year for for years to go and go on you need a, a guy behind center that's um uh, stable who has a good arm who's athletic who's big enough to play um arena ball and especially if you look at graham kelly he's about the same size as mason uh, he's built like uh, like he's built like mason so in this game we've known like if if you if you're a skinny quarterback and you can get hit easy in this game and fast and that might you know shake you but if you're a bigger quarterback you might you know sustain the blow of a uh, big hit especially against defenses uh, defense defensive lines that Jackson will face in like San Antonio and Albany this year so um, but again it's a, a lot of good talent and one thing uh, for the fans out there. Uh, you're going to have Solomon who does this thing and you're going to have Darian Townsend. People say, what's Darian Townsend? Go look at his videos last year. Guy was clearly, I, I this may take off people in the league, but Darian Townsend, in my opinion, was the second best returner last year behind Kyler Rashad. Oh, yes. I, I don't and, think you're wrong in that assessment at all, that if it wasn't for Kyler Rashad, he probably gets that, yeah. gets that nod. So yeah. And what, and, and there's some talented players in this league that all year last year, you Kyler Rashad, uh, Dare, um, um, Kendrick Ings, excuse me, my brain went way left. Uh, Kendrick Ings, Darius Prince, uh, and then you look at other teams last year, like a James Summers made a couple shine, and you go down south and you had uh, Brandon Fuentes sometimes. Uh, so you need players like that, especially this year with the Nets. Darren Townsend, I think, can feast. And if he plays like he did last year with Jackson, for like he last year for Columbus and translates that Jacksonville, Jacksonville's going to have a lethal offense. And mm-hmm. it just from the – uh, if you step back and you look at a team and how teams are built, receivers and especially offset, offense, it always comes out of the quarterback. And especially – I've heard this not from Gibson. I've heard this from all coaches. If you don't have a quarterback in arena football, you're not going to win. Like, oh, it, this is not the indoor game. You need a quarterback who knows how to read a defense, who knows where to put the ball in on the field, and knows how to get the ball away fast. We've seen quarterbacks come through Jacksonville um, uh, uh, from last two years ago. A uh, guy played for Orlando, came to Jacksonville, um, Connor Kagey. Mm-hmm. Like, he looked like an arena quarterback, but the game was too fast for him, and it you know cost Jacksonville a, a lot of games. So, uh, again, this is his again well, first year, so you don't know what Graham Kelly will be. But if you are trying to feel better about your quarterback situation, he reminds me of a Mason Espinosa. Yeah, I I think that that is the big question that once again it seems to be revolving around Jacksonville. Um, it's been the last three years, the beginning of the season. I think that's pe- what people have brought up, and then either it's been like last year gets corrected, or hopefully you don't have a shuffle like. He did in 2021 because that that's I think what people are wondering is, you know, how how much can these guys get down and dirty right out of the gate? Because, um, I mean, Graham Kelly, 
Uh, I think one thing that'll help is that, you know, he, him being accustomed to the Canadian game, he's, you know, him being brought up in Ontario, he was born and raised, he's Canadian born, um, been through several of the Canadian style leagues, um, at least going up through the youth has been through with the Alouettes and the Tiger Cats and camps, um, and also was in the CFL's developmental program in Mexico. So they obviously those elements in the CFL, to me, they translate well to the arena game because you see like. You know, the waggle or the high motion, as they call it, those are using those concepts. So you're aware you get that stuff down. It's a high, it's a heavier set passing game. You try and get the ball out quick, quicker. You're more kind of, I would say, getting a sense of urgency to kind of move the ball Mm -hmm. and kind of press it downfield. Um, And I think for both him and maybe like Eddie Brill, whoever, you know, depending on how the season goes, I know Graham's probably, it sounds like is the leader right now is going to be the guy starting week one, unless things change. Um, you know, I think both of them, these guys seem to have a chip on their shoulder. Both of them are looking for that, you know, true opportunity. You know, Graham's for sure. He's bounced around to de- several different, lo- different uh, venues and avenues in that in the Canadian scene in the sport, but he hasn't really gotten, I think, his true shot to like actually step in and I would say shine fully. So this is his first big one, and it's on a scene that's, you know, I think a good platform for him in the NAL where you can kind of excel as a passer like this. So, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing where that goes. Um, I think Gibson again. You can, as we've told, he can he can evaluate guys. Um, as you, funny enough, you say Mason Espinoza as a comparison, and mm-hmm. guess who's coaching in Jacksonville? So, you know that's not completely out of the out of yeah. the question. Again, it, something that Gibson does well, at least that they, in the last few years that I've noticed, and I think that they're translating over this year, is you know we don't talk much about defense in the arena football being as prominent, you know, it's not, it's something like, yeah, if you can hold a team like to like 30 points, like 35, you're doing a good night. But like Mm -hmm. that's the last, last few seasons for Columbus. That's something that, you know, I think Gibson has been more focused on recruitment is just beefing up that defense, like saying, okay, well, you know, say we can't get, say offensively, we got a good few skill position players and we have a QB that can at least chuck it up to where it's within range of whoever's going to grab and take it and bring it down. You know, on the other side of the ball, we can try and suffocate them as much as you can in an arena term of suffocating your opponent. So that side of the ball for Jacksonville, I think is going to be pretty prominent this year. Yeah. Um, I I think that it's going to be at least out of, if we're talking terms of like top four, it'll be a top four unit. So I'm watching out for that. Um, but yeah, the QB situation, it'll be a question until we see game day uh, week one when they travel or their first game when they travel to West Texas. So We'll find out real quick how prepared uh, Kelly and or, like I said, depending on how training camp goes injury-wise too, or Brill will be mm-hmm. when they step onto the turf. It Questions will be answered soon. And yes. one thing, they're like, there are other teams in this league that already have answers at their quarterback. They already know who the quarterback is. Jacksonville is one of few that there will be quarterback battles to determine who will be on the number one QB. But from, from me – Observations. I wasn't told that by the. I wasn't told by Gibson, or anybody with the Jackson Sharks. Uh, my I'm lean towards Graham Kelly um, being the guy in, to start, but knowing Gibson and like how you mentioned about the defense, um, Gibson's defense is keeps his teams in. Uh, one of the biggest difference. Uh, great example. I think is like week five, week six last year. Uh, Columbus was completely depleted with injuries and. Columbus defense kept Columbus in the game with the Albany empire Mm -hmm. uh, because of their defense. And that offense in Albany was very lethal last year. And if that defense can translate to a Jacksonville style and Jacksonville's defense wasn't an issue last year, um, like a lot of arena teams, um, when you don't show up, you're going, your, your defense is going to give up 50 points. That's usual. Um, But, you look at Clemson's history, like there are some years that they were just averaging only 36 points on defense. That's, that's incredible. Again, points that low. Um, and that's why they're always consistently in the playoffs for uh, Gibson was when he was with Clemson. Now he's in Jacksonville. So that narrative switch it over can very possibly work here in Jacksonville. And again, I think it, the question, a lot of the questions you see from teams is who's the guy behind the helm. That's a big question. If Graham Kelly becomes what I think is, in my opinion, it could be a, a, a next Mason Espinosa like quarterback. Jacksonville will be really good. They're going to be good anyways. I think Jacksonville's defense, especially with the NAL sack leader at midway through the se- season, Sh- and Shakai Holmes returning, 
Um, he played in Orlando last year. Now he's in Jacksonville. That's going to help Anthony Johnson. That's going to help Damian Jacobs. That's going to help uh, Riffro on that defense um, in this season. So, and that also helps the secondary, you know, relax, have time mm-hmm. to look at the quarterback. So it's going to be early in the season. The, Jackson started 0 4 last year, made the playoffs. Two years ago, they started 0 2. Three years ago, they started 0 1. Um, can Jackson just win the first game of the season? That's that's the question. And going out west to West Texas will be a challenge, especially with Kerry Starks um, being uh, over there at the linebacker position. So it's going to be some challenges for a young quarterback entering the league, entering the um, arena game. Um, but for you, Jacksonville Sharks fans, yes, I'm not going to say where to find it. What website? I'm just going to play it because, you know, me with technology, I'd rather do this than advertise it. Like we're on in a. Oh, my bad. Done. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> I feel like we're on an official, uh, on an official broadcast. Just I'm so used to seeing that. Just kind of commercial break. Hit mm-hmm. the hit the season ticket package program up. But yes, again, you know, as we've been saying for all these teams, season tickets are currently on sale, and a lot more. The majority, if not all, the teams should have single tickets up. By next that. week, I know Albany has had theirs up for roughly a week now. Obviously, they they definitely have been you know they got some big news they're also trying to ca- capitalize on too. But they have had their season tickets up for a little over a week now from my from what I have been able to check again. Um, but majority of the teams are going to be up midweek next week for season for single game ticket sales. But still, go get your season ticket packages if you haven't already. Um, it's a great value for for professional sports. It's a fun atmosphere. I mean, summertime, summertime, springtime activities for the family, the kids, and if you're just a professional football fan, and you know, arena football is legit is legit great action with some talented athletes in this league. So, you know, go check it out. Otherwise, season tickets come, or single tickets come up soon. So, hey, maybe you experiment first, then you buy season tickets at a different rate later on in the season or something along that line. Also, Jacksonville Sharks fans, get your season tickets. And when you get season tickets, if you call them, mention that Jim and Zach from Inside the Walls brought you there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it, please. Yeah, we'll get a, get some big kudos. Please. No. <laughs> we'll get some big kudos from there. But speaking of the Jacksonville Sharks and speaking of players and schedules, we had the chance and we were joined by Justin Renfro, uh, a vet. A, you can say a vet, honestly. He's been around for nine years for football, went from the NFL, went to the Canadian League, and he went to other experimental football leagues. But he's making what he stated could be his last ride here in Jacksonville, and there's a reason why. Coming up next, ladies and gentlemen, is our interview with Justin Frenville. Um. Join us today on the Inside the Walls podcast for our continued interviews and coverage of the league, including, of course, for especially our Jacksonville Sharks preview show. We're bringing on offensive lineman, defensive lineman, the Iron Man himself this year, Justin Renfro, joining us for the Sharks. Justin, welcome aboard. Uh, glad to have you on the show, and uh, you know, congrats for uh, signing on as a Jacksonville Shark. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Excited to uh, get to Jacksonville uh, this year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hey, talk about an organization to join up with if you're going into arena here for yourself. Um, first off, you got any initial thoughts? Training camps are coming around the corner. So where are you at currently, um, at least getting ready for training camp, at least as a player? Uh, right now I'm in uh, Edmonton, Alberta, so I'm in Canada. Okay. Uh, stayed up here. I'm training at Eats uh, Elite Athlete Training Systems. Uh, and, you know, just getting ready uh, for the season. Uh, first arena season, so you know, uh, just trying to figure out what's going, uh, how it kind of goes down, uh, the different cleats, just uh, figuring out all the little things. Uh, you know, once we once we get to football, football, football. So looking forward to that. 
Right. Yeah. You're you're no stranger, obviously, to the outdoor game. You've had quite plenty of stops NFL wise. You're talking, you know, you're in Edmont Edmonton, so clearly, you know, you've been with the El- Elks in the past, you know, BC Lions, yes. you know, the CFL scene. Um I guess might as well talk about it since you are saying that, and it is your first arena season. I mean, what, what tips have you gotten so far? Or who you've been talking to to kind of just get up to speed on what you need to know coming in right now? Um, I mean, me and coach Gibson, uh, we, uh, we've been doing a lot of talking, obviously going back and forth. Uh, he's been on my cooking show as well. Uh, you know, David uh, uh, Gilbert, Kelby Johnson, uh, Marvin Ross, I, I know him as Skip. Uh, all guys I've already played with, whether college or professional. So, you know, most of them are just telling me, you know, just it's regular football. It's going to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll do well out there. Just uh, just come ready to play football. So that's what I'm going to do and uh, have some fun. <laughs> well, it's regular football. Besides, it's in the dome and it won't be snowing on you. <laughs> so that's a good Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't have to worry about the weather as well. So that, that'll definitely be good, you know, right outside right now. I just uh, finished snowing, so it'll definitely be good to be in the Jacksonville sun. Well, yeah, currently in Jacksonville, it's 84 degrees and slight humidity, <laughs> not hot, but you've been to Florida. You know how 85 yep. degrees is like cold in the morning time and summertime, and then yeah, it's 100 yeah. degrees, 100% humidity. You're like, geez, <laughs> this is cr- crazy. Um, what made you decide to go to Arena, seeing that you've been a veteran in the CFL? Um, you know, I was, I've been focusing on my cooking show and having a lot of fun with that and um, spending a lot of time in Jacksonville and because my son lives there. And so, uh, you know, uh, Marvin came out to my son's uh, birthday party and, you know, he had mentioned like, oh, you should play with the Sharks because I had mentioned I was looking for ways to kind of be down there and something to occupy my time outside of my cooking show down there. And, uh, you know, he said something, and then Coach called me a couple days later. And, you know, my son, I was with my son, and he was like, he really enjoys the Sharks game. So, you know, I kind of just said, all right, we'll give this a try. And been training, and my body feels good. So uh, just excited to, you know, be able to play for an extended period of time in front of my son and kind of share that experience with him. Nice. Oh, look, go ahead, Zach. My bad. Okay. I, I mean, I was just going to dive in and t- kind of touch base with something you had mentioned a little bit previous. You, you talk about your cooking your cooking show. Um, you yeah. know, I, as I say, you uh, as I'm looking up here for CTV up in Canada, up in Canada, you know, you're highlighting, as it says, uh, high, as one article puts here uh, for Edmonton CTV News. Football player with big appetite for cooking highlights restaurants in a video series. Would you care to jump in? I mean, what where, where are you be tackling here? Where where are you going? You know, what places? Uh, you visiting? So yeah, I mean, um, I'll give you guys. You know, this Jacksonville State. So I'll give you a sneak peek tomorrow on IG. Uh, you know, you'll see the teaser for uh, what's cooking. Jr. coming to Jacksonville. Uh, we already filmed with Carolina Jacks. Uh, coming up, we're gonna film with the uh, crab cake uh, factory down there as well. You know, tons of other restaurants and talks with as well with already to kind of get some stuff going. I'll be also cooking, you know, with the guys on the team and bringing different guys with me as well. So yeah, my cooking show was cooking Jr. Uh, been doing it about the last year and a half. You know, traveling to the top restaurants. Uh, around the world i guess you got you you say now it started out just during covid in my in my suburb and then as uh as things have grown i've hit jamaica i've hit all over the u.s i've been all over canada hoping uh this fall starting to get things ready uh to go over to europe so uh yeah it's been a lot of fun uh cooking great dishes, being able to bring friends and teammates along, also bringing my parents along and, you know, just finding the best food in every city and now bringing that to Jacksonville. Nice. What what inspired you? Are you trying to be like the next Gordon Ramsay or something like this? (laughs) Uh, No, I mean, I like good food. I've always, um, 
every team I played on, I've done a lot of work in the community and also with the youth of the city. So I think a lot of restaurants have always invited me in. Uh, in Calgary, it started in restaurants would invite me in to bring kids with me. And then um, just other places, restaurants invited me in just for a post. And, you know, because my social media could, you know, let people know about them. And so it just grew from there. And now I have aspirations, you know, to kind of do this on a ESPN uh, Sunday countdown type of level. Uh, and, you know, be able to sit down with guys and, and sit down with friend. a lot of guys in the NFL are still friends and sit down with them, have a meal and also break down some real football. And I think uh, that's something that I could bring that's unique to what's out there right now is a real analysis of football on a Sunday or a Saturday with some real cooking. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, it'll be fun. We'll see what happens and uh, just keep building with it. Nice. Well, I know one thing. Offensive linemen, they know how to cook and they know how to eat. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a former D lineman and I play in high school ball. My I don't understand. Offensive, every offensive lineman I've talked to or played with, their mothers, and now them, as they got older, are damn good cooks. Me, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yeah. but that's sweet. I, I love. Like I said I love that little love that person out personality you bring in there. The team, then we can't wait to check that out for that series. Uh, definitely going to yeah. be highlighting or looking out for those. Um, getting back yeah. into football here. You know, I kind of just following a bit your career. I mean, you started out, you're more defensive end. You'd made a bit of a switch to O-line as you're progressing. Now you get to play, at least from what now we're reading off, of course, the roster designation. You know, you're playing designated as OLDL. So you get to kind of get a mix of both old and kind of that new transition. Uh, how are you approaching that? I mean, you get you get kind of you kind of understand both sides of the ball now for what each position needs, but now you get to like actively progress and progressively switch your mindset every series, or at least while you're on the turf. Yeah. Um, and so I think uh, for me, I'm just looking at it. O-line, I'll kind of play my usual way, uh, play aggressive, try to keep guys at the line of scrimmage. D-line, I'm going to, I'm going to play more reading, uh, reading the uh, the offense that's coming at me, you know, and reading the plays. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I played D-line a lot more aggressive, bull rushing, a lot more stabs. Now that I'm older, I'm going to be a lot more working the hands and reading rushes, you know. I know from the opposite side, the, the key to being an O-lineman is making first significant punch. So me as a D-lineman, I'm just going to play hands, and, you know, get that first punch in there. And, uh, you know, I'll be pretty successful. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm going to be, you know, the next sack master, but I, I'm sure I'll hold my own, definitely contribute on uh, both sides, and it'll be fun. Heck yeah, man. Getting, getting, I said, get a little bit of that, that action. Like I said, it's one of the beauties of the Iron Man rules that they like is that, it, you know, it, it kind of helps with, you know, make it stars of the two-way game, but also, you know, you get to, kind of take advantage of maybe something you saw the previous series right out, yeah. out of the bat for yourself yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, for, for you, I, I think this is something I got to ask offensive, offensive line wise. Cause we've, we haven't, I haven't had too many OL <laughs> discussions on here, but I got to ask with okay. being arena, you know, it's a, it's a quicker, fast paced passing. Like you, it's even less time that you have to have for the pocket <laughs> for QPs to kind of get rid of it. Do you find that you, you have to, I assume you find that as a benefit, at least getting to say, okay, quarterback better get this thing out in like two seconds. Otherwise, you know, dude, we're, run, we're running out of time. You can't just do three and out, three and then panic. Right. Yeah. So I think, uh, kind of, especially the way I play, I let you, um, let you be more aggressive. Uh, definitely the ball does come out pretty quick, but I, I think, um, if you just set, you know, setting setting guys a certain way, it uh, cuts down on their options. And so, you know, just keeping guys high and wide is definitely uh, always the thing to do with a line. I think it just will make for a better, cleaner pocket for your your quarterback, no matter what the time. If you keep him high and wide, he's got his time. And so, uh, mm -hmm. that's something. Uh, that's something I'll look to do, and uh, you know, we'll look to uh, 
to have some fun. I'm interested to see the run game. That's uh, right. That's what I've been. That's what I've been interested to uh, kind of figure out what what kind of schemes going to be with that. And so that'll be fun. That'll be fun for me. Uh, you know, I I got to be honest. I haven't watched much arena before this, so uh, we it it will. You know, I've been watching some highlights and stuff just to get uh, kind of acclimated and to see things. I've I've seen games in Trenton before. Um, my okay. house in, in PA is close to the Trenton Arena, so I've had a bunch of friends play on that team. So I've seen those games before. So I'm definitely excited. I know it's action-packed, and from what I hear, uh, Jacksonville keeps a packed stadium as well, so it'll be fun. Yes, indeed. Jim, Jim can definitely attest to that yeah, you are do. going to uh, have one of the best, arguably the best audience in the in the arena in the NAL scene when you're coming there. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, I'm excited. Well, but one thing about arena is that you play all LL offensive line, D line, when offensive line, you can also be a tight end. So hopefully, you have good hands because you might be a receiver. Yeah, out there. <laughs> yeah, I I saw that. Uh, I mean, in high school, I was the number nine tight end in the country uh, coming out of high school. So I used to, I used to be a blazer, but I don't, we'll see now. I'm excited, you know. Whatever coach draws up, I'll execute. So absolutely. Well, no, no one Gibson, he 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 strategizes a lot. He does use his tight end slash offensive lineman. So if you have good hands, you're, he's definitely going to give you the ball. Uh, also. All right. You went to – you played in Calgary. You played in Edmonton, the CFL game. And a lot of people in the United States, you know, NFL, it's their football. They don't care about you know, the Canadian Football League. But here in this arena, we have motion. You're used to mm-hmm. that in Canada because I have, I think, up to three guys in motion at the same time before the snap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How difficult is that as an offensive lineman where you're paying attention to football, but also you see something one flying right by your face, like right at the snap? Uh so honestly, I think it's um, not that doesn't affect me at all. The big thing is the uh, DN. So it's mm-hmm. same thing that same thing I'm gonna do. You know, smart defensive end will watch the motion, and you can use that to jump the snap count. And that's what the true the savvy vets up here in the CFL do. And so that's. That's why I don't like the motion. It doesn't bother you. You, I'm looking at safeties. I'm looking at corners, seeing guys off the hashes, seeing box adjustments, seeing open B gaps. So, I mean, seeing another guy in motion doesn't bother you. But when that DN that you're blocking is using that guy's motion to jump your count, and you're like, man, all right, and that's when you have the stutter motion. You get guys to stutter at the line and back off, and then we redo it. So it's always ways to counteract it, but it, it's a lot of fun if you, uh, you know, it's part of the challenge. And that's uh, especially me. I, I definitely like to talk shit to the DN when, uh, you know, they're jumping off sides, and I know they're jumping, and they still don't get past you. And they'll swear, they're like, no, no, I'm watching the ball. I'll be like, come on, my guy. You, you took two steps before the ball was even snapped. So. You know, it's always good to to uh, joke with them and to get in their head too with the uh, with the tricks they're using. What and you know, I had never I had had that space in my mind, but I had never thought about that because you do with the defensive end. If you get to watch that that waggle as they as they say over there, like or, you know, I guess the motion high motion as we call it in the arena game. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess you as an offensive lineman, you kind of lose that bit of element of surprise that gives your position that slight half a step ahead you know the snap count then you know it sure it still matters but like if you can just watch when the motion hits the line you know when the snap count has to happen so i guess that it almost neutralizes the playing field slightly instead of giving that edge to your your pass blocker or even in your run game yeah definitely and that's like the big thing um a big thing like I would tell my wide receivers up here in the CFL is, yo, know, run the run your waggle the same for me every time. And guys and like receivers would look at me crazy like, what do you care? And then I would explain to them, bro, when when you run downhill hard, even though we're on two, that's gonna get that's that's when a guy jumps off sides for me. 
And when he jumps off sides, okay, now he's second guessing. All right, dang, should I use their waggle? Sometimes it's not gonna, it's gonna mess me up. And that's what, then as an O lineman, that's what I always tell. Like when I'm coaching young O lineman, it's the game within the game. First play, I'm going to cut you. Second play, I'm going to play you true. Next play, I might jump you. Now in four plays, I got you thinking I could do four different things to you. Now let's play ball for the rest of the day. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> for like last year, be like, yeah, you see why Taylor Cornelius is on the ground? Yeah, you went a little too fast yeah. at the line. I got startled <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Deer in the headlights moment. <laughs> yeah. Never thought of it that way. I like. I'm glad to hear that that insight. Funny you also bring up the running backs too, because it, it's funny. You know, guys like guys like your size, it, it can actually be running backs in arena football traditionally, because of the yeah. short yardage. You. Uh, this is more just a curious, fun question. You even think about talking to Gibson, like, "Hey, can I do a goal line situation? Do you do you trust me with the ball? Uh, do I want to do that?" I, <laughs> I I thought about a few. Just maybe a few situations, uh, just you know, so I could celebrate with my son and things like that. Uh, it would be fun. I mean, it would be. It would go back to my roots. So until until my junior year, I did play. I played running back and linebacker in football. So and I've always I was ranked as a tight end coming out of high school. So I've carried the ball. I've had a lot of experience with the ball. Uh, but yeah, you know, we'll just see what um, pan out pans out. I think this could be a lot of fun for me. Uh, first, I'm just focused on getting my legs kind of back under me with playing football, being in the arena game, and then once uh, once that happens, I think we can have a lot of fun though, uh, and I'll make some things happen this year. Nice. So, uh, speaking of you coming to Jacksonville, what are the things that you're looking forward to, and what are the things you're not looking forward to coming back to the state of Florida compared to Canada? Uh, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, the biggest thing is uh, getting to spend the full season with my son. That's probably uh, number one. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, you know, and also being in the States. Like, uh, you know, I wasn't going to play this year. Obviously, I have, you know. The last two years, I've come, I've come back to the Elks late in the season after they fit me up. So, uh, but you know, letting most of my family know this is kind of the last, uh, you know, tour for me. So, you know, trying to get friends and family out to these games, and it it will be exciting. And like you guys are mentioning, uh, the linemen are used differently. You know, I I'll be doing some different things than I usually do. So it will just be fun uh, also to interact with the crowd while playing these games. So we'll see, uh, you know, I, it'll, I think it's just all around going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I think uh, there's I, – I can't really think of anything I'm not looking forward to right now, uh, you know. Uh, football, I'm happy to be back in football, happy to be with a lot of friends too. So, uh yeah, this is going to be a positive uh, trip. That's oh, and awesome. Travel be, and travel will be easy for your family. Yep, yep. Everybody's right there. Got And then all the cities that we play away games, I have uh, friends and family too. So hoping to get a lot of people out. Oh, yeah. You'll you'll have a great time. They'll have a great time. Arena Arena's just – it's. I, I find it is, uh, you know, the best – it's the best elements to me of basketball or any – anything like that basketball NHL just in that more condensed audio kind of focused crowd than anything mm -hmm. else, you know, and it's fast paced action. I mean, you're joining at the right time too. The nets are coming back. It's going to be the, the, th the legit game for the first time in years. So, you know, you're getting in as much as it is fair. Okay. It might be a farewell tour for you. You're getting in at the right time NAL wise yeah. at this moment to see the actual arena game yourself. <laughs> Without a doubt. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it looks like it'll be fun, we, you know, and we're also putting together a good team, so looking forward to competing. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, Justin, before you leave, I just one more question about your history. I guarantee people know, if they look at Justin, where you went to, um, Miami Hurricanes, Florida State Seminole. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, when you see me in the <laughs> arena this year, I'm not a Seminole. I'm a, I'm a Jack Sharks fan. I'm your friend here in Jacksonville. Uh, but rivalry aside, 
uh, the stories I've heard about you behind the scenes from Coach Gibson and other guys around the league, um, you're genuine, family first, family oriented, and you're a good guy. So when you do a cooking show and you need some inside the walls to help you out, you know where to be, you know where to message me because I'm yeah, in Jacksonville, yeah. so I know some good places okay. in Jacksonville to eat. So yeah, that was the only yeah, question. Well, I'm just trying to get on the show yeah. for free. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll have these, uh, we, I'm always looking for guests, especially in Jacksonville. So no, uh, yeah, I'll definitely have you out. Maybe I'll have you out. I'm uh, gonna film ep- the episode with the crab cake pack. Crab Cake Factory uh, right before camp, so maybe we can have you uh, out there. I'll be getting to Jacksonville like a day or two early just to uh, get down there, say hello to people, and then I'm excited to kind of get to camp, uh, see all the boys, and kind of meet everybody, and uh, let's go for a championship. Look at Jim making some moves here to get on t- get on some television. I love it. <laughs> hey, J- Justin, thank you for joining the show, man. We're going to wish you the best. Looking forward to seeing you, uh, you know, get out there and, you know, test out the arena waters this, this year. It should be a fun time for you, and can't wait to watch you out on the turf. All right. I appreciate you guys having me, and I uh, look forward to seeing you this season. Again, to Justin Renfro, offensive defensive lineman for the Jacksonville Sharks, coming on the show. And you're just giving us some insight, not only on just uh, kind of his first year in arena, because we don't always talk to players. It, it's, we have a lot more talks with the veteran guys in this league. There's not too many that we've had where it's like first-time arena players. So it was nice. It's refreshing to kind of hear like someone that's diving in on this scene. You know, even if it is coming towards the tail end of his career, he's at least saying, you know what, I'm going to go – Close, closer to home, closer home here. I'm gonna go and bring the family in. I'm gonna have a good time, and I'm also gonna. It's gonna be doing a cooking show, cooking show. Which again, that was a, that was a pleasant surprise. You know, coming on and re- researching in for the show was, you know, getting to talk to someone that's kind of getting a little bit of celebrity status. Jim, yeah, you trying to jump in and be joining up? Maybe no, me stop. <laughs> Yes, I know all the good cooking spots and places in the cooking spot. Me cook, you know. Um, I know all the good restaurants here in Jacksonville. And also, I've been to that establishment one or two times um, here. Uh, but, yeah, it, it, if he does give us give me a call, I'd be happy to join. It'd be pretty cool. Um, but it, it, it's fun that just, just thinking about just moments ago, I think he's our first offensive lineman that we ever interviewed on the inside the walls. That I am aware of. Yeah, I believe yes, that. We have receivers, quarterbacks. I mean, we've had plenty of receivers, quarterbacks, DBs, linebackers, running backs. Yeah, I. Yeah, yeah I can't think of one that we've had as OLD as OLDL. So, yeah. um, that's also we'll check that box off yeah. as well. You know, I did like his insight, you know, because, again, he he's someone that started out defensive end. You know, he mm-hmm. also played – I mean, credit, he also started high school, played running back and linebacker. But, like, he got into the pro scene as a defensive end. Yeah. He changed up midway through, kind of trying to find his niche to kind of be on a roster, went to the offensive side, which is how he got on many other opportunities in the CFL and in the NFL. And I think that was fascinating just kind of hearing that two-way side. Because I think in – in the Iron Man scene, that was the biggest change last year for us is that, you know, so many guys were specialty in 2021. And then last year, you know, the one that got the most affected for the Iron Man setup for last season was definitely the O line, D line in terms of, you know, you got to be not only bulky and physical and muscular, but you have to be endurance heavy as well. Yeah. You know, you, you're, you can get shuffled out but you're going to be getting basically more of the every down kind of like bully ball play on the turf every single time. And so that was good kind of hearing about what his approach will be to that in terms of how he's going to say, you know, you flip the script every play, you get your mind kind of shifted over going, all right, instead of me being prepared to kind of get that first step back. Now I got to be the first one that's prepared to get that quick jab and knock off the old lineman across from me, get his hands away from my chest and kind of get, to the QB ASAP, especially since you have less time than the pros to get back there and mm-hmm. get to the pocket and get a sack. Those guys need to get that ball in the arena scene. 
I'd say two seconds is your threshold. If you're getting to three, three's pushing it in arena just for how quick and how small the lines are. So that, that was great. I loved hearing that conversation. And he also basically said how it could be an easy transition based on how he played in Canada with the motion or the waggle, as he mentioned. Um, that's a little things, but also what is intriguing is that he's – He's very, you can say he's very humble that he, he's already been through the trials and tribulations of an, of a player playing in the NFL and the CFL and now in the a, in arena league. And this is his first year in the arena. So he's going to, he's going to take time for him to learn the game. And now that he knows that he can be a receiver and a running back in this league, oh, he, he was getting jazz. It was a pretty good interview. And of course his cooking show that is, um, uh, popular i think you it was like ctv you said in the yes up in canada has it mm -hmm. uh, i guarantee you watch it uh, you can definitely find it on youtube because that's how i found it on youtube um, oh yeah so so he'll be in jacksonville uh he's come closer to his family and his son lives in jacksonville his son comes to the games all the time so that was a little bit of a you know a good recruiting tool especially marvin ross helped him make the decision even better so it's cool to have a, some a guy who has had the experience and of course, uh, we had a person message us uh, saying that this is the first time you guys had a blue check mark come on your show. So I was like, okay, yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's a, it's you know it's recognition, but still, um, again, he's in Edmonton right now. Snow, I can't deal with that. Um, <laughs> it's it's going to be a very increasing in temperature wise when he comes down to Jacksonville. Um, but it was a good a good interview. First offensive lineman, D lineman, and. Just seeing how he was relaxed, he's really, you know, he's in that pre-pre-camp mode, like rest up as much as I can because the next three weeks is going to be a battle, especially at camp. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're going to – it's going to get intense here pretty soon, mm -hmm. um, right around the corner. I mean, we talked not only just single tickets like we were talking a bit ago, but like also, you know, training camps are within the next, you know, less than two weeks away for yeah. a lot, for all these teams. So. You know, we're going to be seeing a lot of camp battles coming up here pretty soon, trying to get in shape as mo even more so than they maybe have needed to be, you know, independently of your team's facilities. Um, right. Now be coming quick, a real quick here around the corner. Um, and with that, we'll come, of course, closer to the season, which means we'll schedule. be getting to look at the schedule. We, we well, once As we've done with every show, we will – Oh, you can pop it back up. Come on, you can pop that thing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. I was gonna say, let's talk here. Look, so here's your here's your shark schedule. If you're on the YouTube version, which by the way, recommend you jump on that if you are curious to see any visual gags or whatnot, as well as uh, our graphics that you know Jim and others in our community provide. By the way, thank mm -hmm. you very much. Um, this one provided, of course, in our Discord server, which we'll link in the description below. Below, as you can see. Uh, two things stick out to me right out of the gate, and I think we talked about this in kind of the pre-talk of the show. Um, one, bye weeks. Jacksonville didn't have bye weeks last week, so yeah, or last year. So, you know, yes, they only have three bye weeks, but uh, three is better than none. <laughs> a little bit of a break does uh, does seem pretty nice. You know, I think uh, I think uh, <laughs> I think Silo Burley last year would have appreciated that. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit what, what, when you mean 14 straight 15 straight weeks yeah yeah <laughs> i think i think him or you know coach res would appreciate that but that's just hey the, the cards were different last year this year they got it under order so you get three first off mm -hmm. great second off and this is something that stuck out a lot just because i think everyone other team so far we previewed hasn't had this much of a luxury but uh travel schedule is very balanced for the sharks like there's not there's not really any three game stretches they're on the road or at home like you you kind of two max at most you get them just kind of you know it, it's pretty comfortable it, it's a it's a nice change of pace it's not like you get lulled a little bit from mm -hmm. being being at home or you have to worry about getting worn down from road trip after road trip after road trip you know they get to kind of settle in as they want and it's you know it can, it, a little bit of variance you're not just rely you're not just leaning on one thing or the other you're not uh having one experience kind of drag down your whole thing i mean at max they have a streak of two you know yeah. weeks eight and nine and then home games 15 and 16 otherwise you know it's one 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 across the board back and forth constant mm -hmm. and uh, for a scheduling reason or for coaching reasons too it, it's you can find a way how to prepare a team on a routine schedule. So, yeah. you know, when you guys are leaving, you know, when you guys are coming home, uh, cause sometimes we've seen in other seasons where teams gone for three weeks before they even get home. And by the time they get home, they're, yeah, they're home in their fan, their fan base, but 
mentally and physically they're just out of routine because they haven't had home games. So you've noticed this throughout the league, just not in Jacksonville, though. The schedules are very more balanced. Uh, besides, I think San Antonio is like six weeks away from the home, and Orlando, I think, has five weeks. So, uh, so there's some areas of the schedule that does affect, but a lot of teams have a very balanced schedule. And speaking of schedules and speaking of games, key games for the Jacksonville Sharks. Um, well, I'm going to just say this the first one it's the week two matchups. Week two matchup, not matchups, a uh, matchup against the San Antonio Gunslingers. Um, first off, um, the reason why I think this is a matchup is the first home game. It's the first home game in, in Jacksonville. And also, San Antonio, based on how they're doing their off offseason this year and based on how their team is this season, um, they're trying to be the, you can say, contender uh, for the yeah. crown. They're They're – they're developing a roster that's going to compete. And for Jacksonville's week two against them, this is just makes a either a warning shot across San Antonio's bow or hello, we're still Jacksonville. Don't think you're going to, you know, take the throne yet. You got to go through us first. Um, and especially as you see where San Antonio is and where Jacksonville is. Um, again, last season, Jacksonville had four straight losses and then made the playoffs. I would like to have a better start than 0 and 4 this year for us. That'd be um, nice. But it, honestly, it's in my opinion week 2 at home at Shark Tank 8000 plus. Yeah, kick game. This is kickoff the season. Yeah. Definitely uh, definitely I think in terms of uh, you know, just high profile opponents, you know, kind of early on. I, I think we also had this one on because, you know, after week 1 you know, you're two weeks in with kind of what you're going to be expecting for your QB situation as well. Um, and you're kind of, you know, to me, the gunslingers, they, they also just got, and this is according to our transaction list, you won't, unless they add this as we drop the show this week, um, you know, according to our lists, uh, Justin Alexander is returning to the gunslingers, which uh, last year dude was all NAL talent and was in the XFL in San Antonio uh, before he was put on the reserve and then was kind of let, on let off so he, he's been brought back according to the league's transaction page which means uh that's a big get and that's another test that you're going to have as the sharks to deal with um two straight weeks of just def of defensive talent that's going to be in your face most likely alexander week two and then starks who we mentioned and had on last week or had on of course two weeks prior for week one so Key key stuff. You're gonna Gibson will learn about his uh, about about Graham, about Graham Kelly, how well he's gonna be adapted real quick, and how well this line's gonna be able to hold up mm -hmm. real quick out of the gate. And I think week two is also another good test of like you know they they invested a good chunk in in defense in defensively as well. You know how well can the gunslinger can the gunslingers go play against this uh, Sharks defensive secondary, and as well as what bullies they're gonna have up front. So uh, to me. We talk about litmus test games. This is a good litmus test game mm -hmm. uh, as well. Because at least, like, West Texas, still some unknowns were questioned about because they're brand new. This one, you know what the Gunslingers have. You're you're going to be definitely – project. this will project, I think, to me, how well suited they're going to be where they're at. Because right now we have the Sharks kind of this, like, middle – it's another – we're one of more the mid-pack mid, mid -pack muck type of teams. You know, there, as you've heard on this show, there's two locks we have. We think Albany and San Antonio are the locks. We think they're the they're were the, the the playoff locks unless disaster strikes. The the rest, the other five teams, it's completely up in the air. There, there's there's no there's there. It's hard to kind of pinpoint who we think will be in the in the third and fourth, you know, playoff seedings right now. Jacksonville's definitely in that. They have their own argument for it. So that's a great game for that. Um, as well as for this year, something that in the schedule we're keeping an eye on is you know we talk about. Uh, games that I think decide playoff seating and also tiebreakers. Um, the Jacksonville Sharks have two three-game home sets, but the one that I'm looking at the most, and Jim brought it up on the banner here, Clash of the Empires. Albany is one of their two three-game home mat three-game matchups for an opponent. The other one's West Texas. Uh, as we said, West Texas. Hey, we'll find out soon enough about West Texas at the beginning of the year. But Albany, you already know that's the king. You know, if you're going to aim for the king, you don't miss. You can't miss. So you want to be able to be sure that in this schedule, 
you know, at, at the very least, you hope you can split to then go into that late season rubber match in, in the year that you go home for. You get you get Albany twice at home or at your home state stadium at Vice Star Memorial. So that's nice. You get your home crowd behind you and everything. Your first matchup, you get your home crowd as well behind you too to kind of maybe, you know, hopefully get some early season momentum, early wins. Um, but that to me, that three game series is going to be pretty important. If you can get a feather in your cap with that tiebreaker. And if you're setting yourself up nice for going into that playoff stretch in August, in July. Well, it, you can see the thing between these two games or two matchups with gunslingers and Albany. We both said that these two teams are guaranteed locks for the playoffs in the NL, unless something major happens. Um, Taking on the Albany Empire, the Jacksonville Sharks over the last two years have played the Albany Empire tough, like down to the last quarter besides one game um, that's that was a lopsided game. But the playoff game last year was a one possession, came down to a deuce. Two, uh, two seasons ago, both games were nail biters that one the Sharks won and the other the Albany Empire won late in the season. Jacksonville plays well against Albany. And one thing I've seen from just the how this roster is built in Jacksonville, this series is crucial if Jacksonville wants to reclaim their throne. Um, again, Jacksonville and Albany both have the same reputation. They have the same resume. They have the same pedigree. It's just that currently right now, uh, Albany has won back-to-back championships in the NAL. They both have two titles in this league. Uh, So that's the reason why it's called the clash of empires. These are Mm -hmm. the 1A, 1B of the NAL. And it's who right now, the biggest, even this series and any other teams that we preview, the series, the big target is on the Albany Empire. They know, the Albany Empire know that they have a target on their back. They're the hunted. Uh, They're not the hunter. Jackson was the hunter. So it's it's hard to like we said last year it's hard to win back to back it's going to be harder to win back to back to back this series against albany is crucial because it's a three-game series and technically jacksonville has home home field advantage in that three-game series they play two home games and only go up to albany once um but like you said earlier zach the first two games are crucial make that third game back in jacksonville the could be the determining factor of who may be a two seed who may be a one seed or who may be a team that just gets in. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's like he mentioned, Jacksonville is one of those teams that will be considered in the muck for most of the year. And towards the year, towards the end of the year, this series against um, San Antonio, or excuse me, it's the series against Albany will be crucial. Including the series against West Texas. We don't know what West Texas is yet. And we'll find out pretty soon, but we know what Albany is. They are the King. Um, and, for Jacksonville, they're not used to being the hunter. They're used to be the ones that are being hunted. And it's going to be unique. You know, this is going to be the third year of this matchup. Jacksonville's played them tough. Jacksonville had them on the ropes last year in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. And as a Jacksonville fan who's watched that game multiple times, there are a couple of plays that if it went Jacksonville's way, Jacksonville's playing the championship last year. But those plays were made by San, uh, by Albany last year. And, of course, when Marco Orozco is on the money in a crucial time and your kicker, Blanchard, could not make a kick, um, that was the determining factor in the, cha- uh, the uh, playoff game. But it is – it's going to be a crucial series, and based on the people I know with the Jacksonville Sharks organization, they want to win the series against Albany. Um, you could say it can be the next big rivalry in the NAL, but again, like any rivalry, uh, the other team has to win some, and Jacksonville well, has one win. On the, I think. So well, and you're, I, I know what you're doing. You're you're quoting uh, Gibson here mm-hmm. uh, in one of our last interviews with him because here's the thing. You know, Jason Gibson hasn't, you know, and someone people bring this up, he has not beat Tom Manas in a yeah. matchup. So that is something I think, you know, you have three chances this this year. I think that that's something that's a, my honest opinion, this isn't speaking for Gibson or anything, but I think that's a chip on his shoulder for him, you know, mm-hmm. just because that, you know, Gibson and Manas to, me, to us, we kind of put them as like the two pinnacle top coaches in this league. Yeah. Um, and Manas so far since he's joined the NAL, They've had the, the Empire have had these have had their favor. You know, mm-hmm. all, we this can even go back to 2021 championship. Same deal, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was a heck of a game. That was a heck of a game that came down 
you know, to one half going just a little bit the other way for the Empire and some special teams yeah. plays. So, you know, I think to me, if I'm, I bet some money that Gibson has a bit of chip on his shoulder. He wants at least one of these wins uh, against the Empire. I, I think it, that's something that's, he won't admit that. I don't think any coach would admit that, would admit that in this league, but I bet that that to me has to be in his head that he definitely wants to get that monkey off his back. None of those, any coach won't say that to you. Oh, sure. But, no, I don't think, I don't think so. But like, yeah. I just, it's something that gets brought up in our, in our fan circles. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's there. locker room talk. <laughs> <laughs> that but yeah, it, it, it's a rob. It, it's not a rivalry yet, but for the fans who are outside of Jacksonville, we lost our rival in Columbus um, for this season. Orlando's still our historical rival. So, but matching the pedigree in the national arena league, Albany is identical to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. Two championships. Uh, Albany's back to back. Jacksonville didn't win back to back. Um, but when you look at whoever won championships in the NAL, there are only three teams. That's you know, Albany, Jacksonville, and, and Carolina. So it it's going to be intriguing and it'd be entertaining. Also, it'd be kind of epic if it is the two champ, the two battle of the empires for the championship this year. The two teams with two titles. Um, that you can't count that out. That could be a very, it could be a possibility this season. Um, but yes, the, the Clash and Empire series, in my opinion, will be a, uh, a crucial series. I know it's going to be a fun series for me and you to cover, especially with our relations with both Jacksonville and Albany in this league. So it's going to be pretty cool during those weeks to be a little bit of bantering going back and forth. Uh, it's all, it's fun. It's entertainment. And I'm just glad that we have the opportunity to bring you coverage or, to these games. So uh, again, the Jacksonville shark season is unique. And as a as a sharks fan, just get off to a good start. Don't start 0 4. That was some stressful stuff starting 0 4. <laughs> yeah. well, it would put you in a hole. I mean, look, like for how competitive this league is the last few years, you, you really you can't wait around or mm -hmm. well, no one waiting around sounds like that they're not trying trying hard, but you, you can't let opportunities slip by. And I know and you can definitely say Jacksonville did early in the going last year. Credit they righted some wrongs when they brought in Arvell Nelson, and that ship was definitely corrected to end the season and get a playoff berth, yeah. you know, not and avoid two straight years of missing mm -hmm. a seed, but for the sharks organization, for what they are in the NAL, you know, and you'll, you'll say this too. I know. Cause we've talked, you know, fourth seed doesn't cut it even for that. You know, you want home games. You want, you want to be able to go back to the, you want to be able to take advantage of your massive home field advantage that mm -hmm. you have that fan base that's why it's so much more crucial, I think, to get like, for example, you know, you beat you if you can win and maybe like split that series with San Antonio, if you can win that series against Albany, you know, and then you are able to, you know, kind of become a bit, you know, above the rest of them, that kind of muck crowd we put in mm -hmm. there, you know, you can possibly have yourself sitting at that, you know, shoot, I mean, you could be within that one to two spot section at the end of the season. And if they get that audience, which, as we've seen, Six to nine thousand is the norm, and that's yeah. pretty big it, by any arena standard in the country. I mean, that's top one of the top ones in the country for average attendance. That's mm -hmm. huge. So yeah. you definitely want to be able to get that. So they know they they brought they brought in Gibson for one reason to go go back to the promised land like they had back in 2019. This is that first step that direction, and we'll see. You know, yeah. coaching coaching style is definitely there. You know, will he get the most out of his guys for sure? Will be enough to get over the hump of that is, I think, San Antonio and Albany. We'll find out pretty damn soon, uh, coming into week two especially. Yeah, you, you'll find out pretty early if Jacksonville is going to be a team that's going to contend for a top two spot, or they're going to be a team that's going to be trying to find themselves to hold on to the top four. But again, like what you said, in Jacksonville, the four seed is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Jack, we're, we're we're the organization that's supposed to be the one. We're the organization that's supposed to be the two. We're the organization that runs this league. That's Jacksonville. That's how this Jack team was built um, many years ago, especially the existence in former leagues. Um, as a consistent winning organization here in Jacksonville, uh, for many years, um, the Sharks were our winning team, uh, not, not the team across the street. 
Jacksonville, that's the reason why we always have average good fans is because people know they come to Jacksonville Sharks game, they're going to see a winning product on the field, and they're going to go home happy and not depressed and not drink six packs of beers because, you know, Jaguars slide Blaine Gavick to a massive extension when you shouldn't do. Um, excuse me, Blake Borles, but still, same difference. Uh, but, yeah. Mm-hmm. For Jack, uh, for for Jacksonville's sake, it's um, a lot, the the feeling that I'm getting here from a lot of the fans is get to a good start, start off early, get off a couple wins early, and then not have to you know, you know uh, the say in hockey, get the points early. You don't want to be chasing at the end. Um, right, and right. J- Jackson, what Jacksonville did last year is that they couldn't early, couldn't win early, and they were chasing wins at the end to get into the playoffs. Don't do that this year. Um, but I'm very confident of Jacksonville. Like I've said earlier in my predicting to make the playoffs, I think they are going to make the playoffs. Um, but right now, I still think they're a, a solid three seed right now between uh, San Antonio and Albany being one and two. Uh, so or two and one who or wherever someone's going to say, oh, Jackson, Jim, Jim says that San Antonio is going to be number one seed. <laughs> um, no, I just think those two teams right now, San Antonio and Albany are going to be the two teams hosting. So um, it's going to be early season. And of course, it's, it's this is a preview show. We don't know what's going to happen. Crap. By week eight, we might see Jackson is the best team in the league and Albany and San Antonio can't get out of their own way. It can happen. Um, that's an interesting thing about the sport. You can have the best team on the roster. If you're not going out there each Saturday, Friday, or Sunday and executing, you're not going to win football games. And I don't yeah. care what league you play in, even in an arena. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's going to be a long season. And one thing I know is that uh, we're running out of time in this episode. So for the fans out there, um, again, I just want to, you know, I want to apologize. I really do want to apologize for doing this. I hate doing this. I was gonna click that. I didn't know if you, I didn't know if that was something you were gonna say, but I was, you you did exactly what I wanted. So yeah. you just made the list. Ah, made my list. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, next week we head down to the well, we're still in the state of Florida, so we head south to the Amway Center where we Ooh. preview the Orlando Predators. Um, guests will be announced earlier in the week. We will let you know. But that has been the Jacksonville Sharks preview show. I know it's preview is pretty hard to do things, and I try my best and not look act like a super fan. So um, I think I did well. You I did think. good. You did good. It was fair fair analysis. I say it's fair analysis. Huh. That's my opinion. You did good. Right. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> no I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm done. I think it's a good sign. I'm cutting it off. We're cutting it off right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but, yeah, no. folks. Thank, thanks for tuning in. As as Jim said, we'll we'll be previewing <laughs> we'll be previewing the Orlando Predators next week. Uh, plenty to discuss, and uh, maybe some uh, rediscussion on one specific position that I definitely have had my thoughts on since our a topic. But we'll, we'll talk next week, everybody. Uh, until next time, you know, catch us on our usual channels at In Walls Pod, Facebook, Instagram. And Twitter as well. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And as, uh, of course, one show I like to do says as well, uh, when you subscribe, click that bell. It builds morale, not only for you, but for us too on this side of the show. Um, stay tuned. NAL season's coming around the corner. We're st- one more step towards week one this early April. See you soon, everybody. Catch you next week. Covering all your favorite parts of the 50-yard fight. This is the Inside the Walls podcast with Zach Kyle.